Hey everyone, I'm Ken and welcome to the second lesson where we're going to be learning about Xcode. If you haven't downloaded Xcode, go ahead and pause this video and find it on the Mac App Store. It'd be very useful if you can follow along with me. Once you've installed Xcode, open it up and you'll be presented with one of these windows. If this is your first time opening Xcode, you might be prompted with a user agreement or be asked to install updates. Once you complete those steps, you'll see this screen. So on this screen, we're going to go ahead and create a new project. A project is basically a bunch of files and settings that come together to form an app. So now we're going to select the create a new Xcode project option. And here we're going to be asked to pick a template. We're going to go ahead and select the game template. So here you have some options. First, the product name is basically what the app name is going to be. So for us, we're just going to put in snake. Next, the organization name refers to who created this app. So you can either put your own name or put a company name. The organization identifier is similar to the organization name, and it's just something to identify your organization by. If you think of the organization name as the author, you can think of the organization identifier as like a signature. Typically, people will use a reverse.com notation, which is just com dot your name or your company name. For the language, we're going to make sure to have Swift selected. For game technology, we're going to select SpriteKit. And for devices, we're going to leave it on iPhone for now. So once you're satisfied, we can click Next. And don't worry, you can change these things later. Next, you're going to be prompted to pick a location for your project. I'm happy with the folder that I'm in. But for you, you can go ahead and pick a location where you want to save the project. You can even just put it on the desktop for now if you don't know where to put it. Once you're done the setup, you'll be launched into this really confusing window. Um, it's pretty daunting at first, but I'll break things down one at a time for you. If you see this warning right now, dismiss it and I'll come back to it in a little bit. Before we even do anything, I want to introduce something to you called source control. If you look at the top, you'll see a tab for it. And source control is basically a way to keep track of any changes you make to your project. I know that when I go through tutorials, I always make sure what I'm doing is exactly the same as the instructor. And source control is a good way of making sure that happens. If you click on this menu, you'll see a bunch of options. The two that we're concerned about is commit and discard all changes. Commit is basically a way of saying to save all your changes and discard all changes is pretty self-explanatory. You can simply just ignore all the other options as they relate to dealing with source control on a server. Now going back to the previous warning, it was actually related to source control. Because source control keeps track of who made the changes, the warning was basically saying that it didn't know who you were. So in order to fix this, we're going to bring up terminal, and you can do that by pressing command space to bring up Spotlight and then typing in Terminal and pressing Enter. So once Terminal is open, you can put in these two commands, git config dash dash global user dot name and then your name in quotations and then press Enter. Next you're going to put in git config dash dash global user dot email and then put your email in again in quotations and then press Enter. Once you're done, close Terminal. If you see a bunch of M's and A's, that means you haven't taken your first snapshot yet with source control. And so in order to do that, we're going to go to the source control tab and select commit. And then this window will pop up at the bottom, put in a message. So for us, we can put in initial commit and then we're going to press the commit files button. So now a snapshot of your project has been saved. Normally when you create a new project, Xcode will do this step for you. So you only have to go through this procedure when you get that warning in the beginning. And also because we went through that step where we typed in all that stuff in terminal, that means the next time we create a project, we also don't have to do this manual commit process for the first commit. And now source control has a snapshot of our project. So with this in mind, you won't have to be scared about doing something you're not supposed to. For example, if I were to go here and accidentally hit a 1, 
And for some reason that just completely broke the project. I can go to source control and just click discard all changes. If I do that, you'll see it goes back to one. So now that you learned that, you can safely play around without any repercussions. Throughout this series, I'll also be reminding you guys to commit your changes so that you won't lose them. Okay, with that out of the way, we can look at what Xcode is. The whole purpose of Xcode is to help developers like you build apps. So the main focus of this program is the editor in the middle, which allows us to change files within our project. Everything else kind of revolves around the editor. And in the top right, we can actually hide and show panels to the left, bottom, and right of the editor, but never the editor itself. And each area around the editor has a specific purpose. So the panel on the left is the navigator, and from its name, you can tell that it helps us move around the project. The panel on the right is called Utilities, and it's a little toolbox that provides us useful information and utilities. The panel on the bottom is called the Debug Panel, and it shows us pieces of information when we're running our app. And the area on the top is called the Toolbar, and it helps us with building our project into an app. And the portion in the middle will show us any status messages regarding our project. So now that we have a brief idea of what each part does, we can take a more detailed look as to how we'll use these parts when we're developing our app. Now there's going to be a lot of information, and I'll try to point out all the important parts, but I won't go into very much detail when it's something that we won't be using very often. To begin, we need to learn how to move around the different files in our project. And you'll remember that the navigator on the left helps us to do that. So in the navigator, you'll see a whole list of files, and they sort of resemble something like a file structure. In order to change which files we want to edit, we simply single click, and you'll see that both the editor and utilities change depending on the type of file we click. Right now we click the .swift file, and those are the type of files that store all our code. If we click that big file at the top, it takes us to project settings where we can change things related to our app. Remember, to move around, we only need to do a single click. If you accidentally double click, you'll just open a separate window that you can move around. In the navigator, we can also right click to get a bit more information, as well as get some shortcuts. So we right click on this file, we can show our file in Finder, or we can quickly add new files to our project. At the top are a bunch of buttons that represent different tabs that will change what we see in the navigator. And this tab idea is a very common theme in Xcode. In the bottom, there's some quick shortcuts that allow you to filter the files you see. And like most things in Xcode, if you're not sure what a button does, you can simply hover over it and a tooltip will come up. Well, what are some of the tabs in the navigator? So right now we're in the project view, which shows us all the files in our project. The second tab is a symbols view that allows us to navigate to different symbols in our code and we'll learn what that means later on. In the third tab, we have a search view, which allows us to search through our project. You can also change some of these settings so that you can, for example, replace text or match text in a different way or even specify where to look within the project. And again, there are a lot of buttons in Xcode, so you can either hover over them or click around to see what they do. In the fourth view, we see any issues in our project. The fifth tab shows us test cases in our project. The sixth is a debug view that shows us any information while we're debugging. The seventh view shows us any breakpoints we have in our project. And again, a lot of these terms won't make sense, but I'll explain them when we come to them in the future. And lastly, we have the report view, which just shows us any status messages that we've encountered in the past. Most of the time, though, we're only going to be looking in the project view. As you saw earlier, our editor will adapt to which file we're looking at. Most of the time in our editor will be spent editing code. And how this works is like most text editors. For example, text edit or Word. You can simply just type into it. There's a little breadcrumb trail at the top that allows you to quickly jump to different files or even sections of your code. And actually, the three buttons at the top toggle what the editor looks like. So we have our standard view. We have an insistent view, which can allow us to compare two different files of code side by side. And lastly, we have a comparison view, which allows us to see any changes we've made since the last commit. 
And one quick hint is that for source control, commits are like taking snapshots, and that's different from saving a file on your file system with command S. And this difference will be more clear as we go along. We're going to switch back to the standard view. So the utility panel on the right has two regions, and the top relates to the file currently in the editor. We can use the first tab, which is the file inspector, to look at information related to the file. Another point to bring up that causes a lot of confusion for beginners is that the files in the navigator don't necessarily correspond to the file structure in Finder. And what I mean is, let's say you look at this file in Finder, you can see the file structure right here. But actually in our project, we can create new folders called groups. And we can move our files within our groups. For example, I can put these two files in this group. But again, if we look at this file in Finder, we'll see that the location of the file itself doesn't actually change. This seems really confusing at first, but again, this just takes time and you'll get used to it eventually. So again, if we didn't like our changes, we can go to discard all changes. And now our project is back to the way it was before. The other tab that you'll be using often in utilities is the quick help. So the quick help will show you documentation related to wherever your cursor is on. So if you don't know what something does, you can kind of select it in the editor and the quick help will give you some information about it. Again, because the utilities panel reacts to the type of file that shows up, if you, for example, go to this storyboard file, which shows you layout, you'll get more tabs that do different things. And we won't really go into the details of these tabs right now. In the bottom of the utilities panel are templates that we can drag and drop into our project or our editor. And again, each tab just basically has different sets of objects we can drag into our project. We won't be really using this too much as it's important to learn how to do this yourself. So this debug panel on the bottom shows us any messages that the app will have when it's running. So you might be wondering, how do we actually run the app? If you're curious, you might have already seen the play button at the top left. Go ahead and click it and see what happens. Now, if it's the first time you're doing development on your laptop, you might see this prompt come up. And basically what it's asking you to do is to enable development mode on your computer. So go ahead and do that. But once you're done, you should see the status of the project start to change. And what Xcode is doing right now is, is taking all the code in our project and building it into an app. And once it's done, it should send it to a simulator and then the simulator will pop up. So here you'll see the simulator with our app. And this is actually running. So if we click on it, we can bring up spinning spaceships. So this is what our app does right now. And all the code that you see in our project does this. So we'll go ahead and press this stop button to stop the project from running. So the next two buttons are joined together and actually relate to what we just did. The button on the left is specifying something called a target, which is a set of configuration that tells Xcode how to build our app. Most of the time we won't be changing this, so it's okay to ignore it for now. But the part on the right is probably the more interesting part. You'll see that it says iPhone 6, and that actually relates to the simulator that popped up. If you click it, you can actually see a list of devices that you can pick from. And it actually allows us to launch a different version of the simulator. For example, if we pick iPad Air, and then we press the play button again, this time an iPad simulator will pop up. Again, it's running the same code with the spinning spaceships, but it's in a different size and it looks a little bit different. So, so we'll go ahead and stop that again. And actually, if you look at the top of this list, it says iOS device. And if you have a device plugged in and you have a paid developer account, you'll actually see it in this list as well. So you can think of this set of two buttons as the one on the left telling Xcode how to build it, and the part on the right telling Xcode where to send that build once it's done. So that's pretty much all the things we need to know about Xcode for now. This was a longer video, but I hope you found it helpful. And if you did, be sure to give it a big thumbs up. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions or have any suggestions for the series. 
in the next video, we're going to actually start learning how to code. So make sure to subscribe and be notified when it comes out.